Welcome to Cousin Sal's winning weekend. I know you thought for sure I'd take the vacant Jets job by now, but management decided I was too knowledgeable and they passed. Oh, come on. Nah, what are you going to do? But that means I'm back on this great program. Lots of great week six action to get to. But first, let's recap the NFC West matchup between the Seahawks and the 49ers. All right, here we go. I have Seattle plus three in the hook and I'm already a winner. Look at those beautiful blue Seahawks jerseys. I'm seven years old all over again. Speaking of seven-year-olds, Gino looked like one floating that pass for an easy INT. San Francisco's backup kicker makes them pay. Three zip. Some back and forth. Nothing. Second quarter now. Purdy to Debo Samuel and he's tackled. No, he's not tackled. No one can catch this guy. Debo first touchdown pays plus 850. No one I know had it. Teams trade field goals. Niners up 16-3 at the break. San Francisco takes a second half kick. Goes right down the field. George Kittle scores. Trust me, he was in. And the monster Gronk spot to follow. Now you're just rubbing it in, George. 22 to 3, ensuing kickoff. This one's going to the house. I knew the Seahawks would eventually score a touchdown. 22 10. And then another TD. Kenneth Walker, the third. Is Shanahan going to blow another big lead? Nah, Gino ain't letting it happen. Another INT. And then another Kittle touchdown. It's all decided, but the total 46. Need to get to 48 and a half. Fourth down. Gino back to pass. Touchdown. The game goes over. And all that didn't matter as the Niners scored again. San Francisco 36-24 final. My plus three and a half was garbage. Congrats to Richard Sherman. At least one of his former teams won. Coming up, we've got a guest with both brains and brawn. Former NFL offensive lineman Jeff Schwartz will join us. He's going to talk to us about how parity is affecting NFL betting. Oh, I hate it. And he's going to help us break down the huge college football clash between his alma mater, Oregon, and Ohio State. Then, Every game is a huge game for this guy. Everyone's brother, Bry Sicoli, will join me to break down the week six slate. But before that, last week on the show, I asked you to share your Sunday television setup with me. I wanted to see who had it worst using the hashtag, hashtag my TV is crap. And I want to basically reward one of you video impaired fans with a brand new 50 inch flat screen. We received a lot of entries last weekend. Here are just a few of the ones I deem the worst, AKA the best. So we got this one from at the ML Harris, who is watching, well, he's not watching, he's staring at a laundry machine, which unless you figure out a way to bet on Tide Pods, isn't ideal for Sunday viewing. And then this one comes from at Okwa Tinqua, I'm not even gonna try. Tommy J is his name. He apparently lives in a museum. I mean, look at this monstrosity. That TV is back from when Milton Burrow was defensive coordinator of the Baltimore Colts. We got one from Andres, who either has the smallest television I've ever seen or the biggest wall. Andres, if you don't win, I still may send you a telescope. Great socks though, dude. And we also received this one from at Duffman KC calls himself CJ, and he calls this the red screen of death. And I'm not sure if that's a color rush game we're looking at between the Chiefs and Cardinals or an episode of The Handmaid's Tale. It actually looks like what happens when your TV screen freezes on the Netflix open. Anyway, you see I have my work cut out for me trying to pick a winner. We're going to keep this going. This contest is going to go for one more week. If you think you have a worse Sunday setup than those Send me a video of it on Twitter at the cousin Sal. Hashtag my TV is crap. And next week on this very show, I'm gonna announce the winner who's gonna receive a brand new 50-inch flat screen TV, courtesy of yours truly. All right, let's keep this train moving right now. It's time for my irrationally angry attempt to make rational sense of a somewhat irrational bet. It's wager rager. <laughs> State this week. You know, unless he dropped out and didn't tell us, my eldest son is currently a sophomore at the University of Oregon. Now, I can't hedge on my son becoming a cardiologist, but I can hedge some tuition loot on this particular game. I don't need to take Oregon to win, but I will be betting the Ducks to score over 24 and a half points. Oregon, 34 and 1 at Autzen Stadium over the last six years. Their run game ranks number three in EPA per rush in the nation. Dylan Gabriel, he's going to find Tez Johnson and Treshawn Holden. I think they hit 30 points. We're going to go over 24 and a half. And if they win, Archie, don't you dare carry that goalpost back to your dorm room. It's not exactly a resume builder. That's Wager Rager. All right, let's bring in our guest. He spent eight years in the NFL blocking some of the league's best now. He blocks nerds on social media that disagree with his gridiron takes. You can catch him on SiriusXM and Fox Sports, breaking down games every week. The man, the myth, the mitzvah, Jeff Schwartz. What's happening, Jeff? 
Um, a little under the weather. So that smoker's cough right there is not actually how or laugh. That smoker's laugh is not actually how I, I, I laugh. But uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. A uh, lot, a lot of football going on. Are you, are you taking the Jets job? Is, is that, I is think that, uh, if, if it's available, if I can get out there in time, I just yeah. If you weren't sick, I think it would be your job for sure. But we're gonna dub in a, a, a healthy laugh for you because we have enough of those on tape. But yeah, let's get right to that, Jeff. What's going on, Robert Sal? This is a guy you defended till the end. I don't care that he's 20 and 36. He needs to stick around. He is the coach of the future, and now he's gone. Don't you feel a little silly? Uh, I, I don't know if I defended him. I don't know. If, uh, <laughs> we, me. Here's the thing, Sal. Two things, right? One is that if you're going to fire a coach after five games. You should have fired him in the offseason, right? Like, yeah. what, what's the purpose of this? If he's already on the hot seat to enter the season, you could have for, you know, could have guessed how this was going to go. The new report, by the way, how about this? Uh, Jets head coach Robert Saul was considering firing an OC Nate Hackett before he was fired himself I heard on Tuesday that. morning. So yeah. this feels like Aaron Rodgers' fingerprints all over this, right? Um, he didn't like Sala. He didn't get along with him. You know, they claimed that there was no no uh, no sort of you know tiff there, or whatever. But it does feel very much like this is a decision made by by the quarterback who you seem beholden to because the defense was not the problem. Now, I don't think they're terribly coached well. They're not a disciplined football team in general. And Robert Saul has lost a lot of games. But yeah. the problem is the offense. Is You have Nate Hackett as your OC. He has right. never been good, Sal, anywhere he's been. And yet, we act like he's going to be some savior because he has Rodgers with him. Um, it's not going to turn out well for the Jets. Uh, they're an unserious organization. And after this year, they're going to have to basically – restart everything over again. I want to talk about the state of the NFL in general in terms of spe- especially betting on favorites. Congratulations, first of all, to you and your offensive line brethren. I feel like you got it together and scoring is up and a lot of these uh, games are now more appealing. Can we have a favorite win every now and then, though? I know you're a smarter better than taking money line parlays with favorites, but I'm not. And I'm sick of seeing not only the biggest favorite <laughs> lose every week, but like the two biggest favorites go down every single I- week. You know, we don't hit anymore in training camp. We don't practice like we used to. There's less preseason games. It takes time yeah. to be good on offense. And now we've had five games. Offenses are figuring things out, right? Defense, you know, the, the too high discussion, they're figuring out to run the ball a little bit more now. And so we're seeing a little bit of a balance now back to um, a little more offense. And I just think there's – the NFL is made for parity. And outside of the Chiefs, for whatever reason, who don't seem to lose – um, there's a lot of parity this season. And so you have a situation where Arizona, you know, goes into San Francisco and, and beats them because the Niners just aren't as good this season. Um, yep. And we're seeing it more often this year than ever before. And I think that's the reason why. There's just a lot of parity right now in the league. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about those Chiefs, your Chiefs. You love them. I mean, you, you played for like 16 teams, but you you picked the Chiefs uh, as the team you're going to back all season. And why not? They're 5-0. and Now, Patrick Mahomes is plus 230 to win MVP. People say that's a little bit short, um, considering he has six touchdowns and six interceptions. I think he's running the ball better than he ever has, and he's fascinating. But the flip side to that is if you don't like Mahomes as MVP because the quarterback play hasn't been stellar, why wouldn't you like Andy Reid at 30-1 to 1 for Coach of the Year? Why he, is he never in the conversation for Coach of the Year? This team had the toughest schedule in the first five weeks and injuries on offense. Yeah. I don't have to list them for you. Pacheco, right? Rice out. Um, why isn't Andy Reid in the conversation for Coach of the Year? He's only won Coach of the Year one time, I believe. That was like in 2002 with the Eagles. Yeah. I don't know, man. Um, Mike Thomas never won Coach of the Year. Kevin O'Connell's going to win, obviously, I think, as of right now. I don't know why. Maybe because it's expected he's supposed to win all these games. Um, but, yeah, look look at the game last night. They, their, their wide receiving crew was Travis Kelsey, obviously, like Hall of Famer, and then backup tight end, third string tight end, fourth string tight end, a cast off from the Jets, a cast off from the Patriots. Um, uh-huh. you know, and they're continuing to score points. Like Kareem yeah. Hunt, who hadn't rushed for that many yards in four years, whatever it was. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think he should win coach. Mahomes MVP – He's not played as well as previous years. He might default win the award for Chiefs for 13 to 4, Sal. But, mm. you know, I think if you're looking for MVP market, Lamar again, Josh Allen. Um, I mean, I, I don't think Sam Darnold, but maybe Jared Goff, because I think the Lions are really good. Uh, if they win the NFC or the top seed in the NFC, maybe he's your guy. Uh, but it does feel like a sort of a depressed market right now. There's no real front runner. Um, you know, the Ravens are 3 and 2, Josh Allen, they're 3 and 2. Mahomes is 5 and 0, oh, but, you know, not playing his best football. And Sam Donald's I mean, not going to win the award. So I'm curious to see sort of where this breaks out. I think it's tight. I think it's only plus 230. He's got the, the low number because 
it kind of has to be a top two seed uh, if you if you go by the historical. Part, yes. Right. Yes, and so does, at yeah. five and oh, you would think the Chiefs would end up with a top two seed. Bo Nix, you happy with him? What's going on in Denver? I feel like I, he's different yeah. from the other two. He, he, every game he seems to, it seems to be his first game, you know, and he has takes a little time to warm up. And then the fourth quarter, he's as good as uh, most quarterbacks out there, I feel. They're three and two. Uh, it's yeah. pretty impressive. And they get the Chargers this weekend. Uh, who off a of bye, who knows who's healthy for, for the Chargers right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the Denver defense is, is playing complimentary. They're really good. Sertan's been incredible. Um, yeah, Bo Nix, I think it takes him a little bit of time in games to get settled in. I liked that him and, and, and Sean Payne had a little yelling match the other day. I don't think Sean Payne actually yelled at him, but I like to see that passion. That means he cares, right? He's trying to win. Um, and disagreements are fine. They're grown men. It's emotional. You're playing football. Um, but we're seeing growth. I think all these quarterbacks, like we're seeing what happens with more reps. You get more reps, you're better at football. It's not a surprise. Daniel's getting more reps. Caleb Williams has been, has been better, and Bo Nix is going to be better. Now we got Drake May. It'll probably take him a, a couple weeks to, to kind of get going here to feel to feel comfortable. And uh, we went in the year with with four teams who feel like they have their franchise guy. Yeah, I like it. All right, we'll talk more Bo Nix, alma mater, Oregon. We're going to be right back with Jeff Schwartz. He's going to stick around. Oregon, Ohio State this week. I know he has thoughts. Cousin Sal's winning weekend. Back in two minutes. We're back with Jeff Schwartz, former NFL lineman and Oregon Duck legend. I went to a game last year in Eugene and saw his picture in some hallway. And I'm like, that's my friend. He's got a lot more hair and uh, some beer sweats in the picture. But that's my guy. Do you get back there uh, and, and reminisce and, and marvel over what was back there in Eugene back in the day? I, I did have long hair in college. Uh, yeah, you did. Like on my shoulders. Um, <laughs> I went back last year with my kids for Labor Day weekend. That feels to be the, the best weekend to do. It's just a long way from Charlotte to get there. So... We yeah. had a lot. We had a lot of fun, um, and you know those games are typically early, earlier against you know I think it was Portland State, right? It's like a twelve noon kickoff. So with yeah. the time change, it's easy for my kids. They they treat us so well. When we go back. I was honorary captain, um, and it was so much fun. Let's talk about this huge Big Ten showdown: Oregon, Ohio State. Yeah. College game day is going to be there. My son Archie um, is a sophomore. He's gonna he'll be uh, up early for that, even though it's a night game, monster game. Uh, almost a certainty, I would say, that both teams make the playoffs either way. But let's start with that line. The look ahead before the season was Oregon minus one and a half. It's now shifted to Ohio State laying three and a half on the road. Is that fair, that five-point swing? I, I think so. Um, but we did see, Sal, a couple sharp groups did hit it yesterday to took it yeah. from four down to three. So it might be back at three and a half now. It's about right. Um, you know, you take home field advantage and there's real home field advantage here into this and, you know, maybe neutral site. This is an eight or nine point game. That feels a little high neutral site. But um, look, I think that the most basic way to look at this game is Ohio State has more ways to win. It doesn't mean they're going to win, but Oregon doesn't have a throw to Jeremiah Smith touchdown play in our playbook. Like we don't have that, right? right? Ohio State has that. Like that gives them a little bit of an out that Oregon doesn't have. Can Oregon win this game? Absolutely. I think we match up well in the trenches. It'll be a good test for both these teams. Um, we might have a little more depth on the defensive line. They have more depth at wide receiver running back. Uh-huh. Um, so, uh, again, I think it just comes down to Gabriel. If Gabriel is is playing his best game, we can win. If it's anything less than his best, it, we'll probably need some turnovers, sort of things to go our way uh, to win that game. So give me a pick. Give me. I think you're right. I think since they made the offensive line switches, they've been yeah, more dynamic great. offensively. That helped. Uh, Gabriel kind of, you know, uh, uh, not flashy, but, you know, it's cut down on mistakes. Like, you know, he doesn't have yeah. seven or eight interceptions. Only a couple miscues here. Yeah. So do we have uh, enough uh, to win? I, uh, I, the total kind of baffles me. It's 53, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't get that. I, I, I guess if, if Ohio State's going to win, maybe it is low score. I mean, Oregon has to win this game like 35-32. Like, uh-huh. I don't think they're going to win this game 24-21. Um, so give me, uh, give me, give me 35-31 um, Oregon here. Um, one of my favorite stories in college football is uh, the Boise running back, Ashton Jante. Yeah, he was yeah. like ha- not even halfway through the season, 1,031 yards, rushing 16 touchdowns, played very well against us, and I was like, oh, boy. This uh, and I think you felt the same way. Like, all right, I feel a little better now that this guy is just running all over everyone. Is he plus two forty? It's funny, he's about the same odds as Mahomes to win MVP, but he's plus two forty to to win the Heisman. Does he run away with this if he keeps up the pace? Um. Well, 
I mean, they're going to have to finish 11 and 1, right? And be a playoff team, 12 and 1 for this to happen. You think Sal? so? Oh, yeah. to be a playoff team. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, from the win the Heisman, right? He's not going to win the Heisman if they're 9 and 3. Well, LSU lost three games. I know it was in a tougher conference, but there is a little wiggle. Sure, room, I mean, yeah, I well, Lamar yeah. was 9 and 3, too, I think, at Louisville. But yeah. the fact is, like, this is a running back from a G5 program, right? Now, rushing for nearly 200 yards against Oregon is a big deal. That's going to play well because Oregon's run defense is really good. Um, mm. But I don't, I don't think so. I actually think the winner of the Oregon and Ohio State game, that quarterback probably has inside track into winning the Heisman. Really? I still think Jalen Milrow is a good option. I think he's eleven to one today. Bama's still going to win a lot of football games, and he was fine on offense the other day. It wasn't his fault they lost that game. Yeah, I guess all these teams will probably end up with one loss. You're right, but I, I was also looking at that because Dylan Gabriel's fourteen to one. I was like, wow, he'll be top three if he has a good game, like we hope. But it's funny you say Ohio State quarterback. Well, Jeremiah Smith is forty to one, and then Will Howard yeah. is fifty to one. I don't. I wonder if that's too far down to leap into yeah. the conversation here with top three. Well, Jeremiah Smith is certainly good enough to win this award. Um, yeah. It's just if you end up having a situation where. Uh, are you choosing between Will Howard and Jeremiah Smith? Who gets the nod, right? So that's, I think, the yeah. question is who gets the nod. Jeremiah Smith can certainly win the award. He's incredible. Well, well, but Travis Hunter's the only other one I wanted to talk about, plus 320. Yeah, I mean— What I, do they have to do? What, what Do they have to win Colorado? Uh, they, they might just be good for six wins and him playing both yeah. ways to the finish line. I have a, I have a Travis Hunter plus 3,500 ticket for the Heisman. Wow. So, um, Hopefully you survive to, long enough to cash it. Well, yeah, I mean, this is one of those situations, too, where you know, the cash-out option, which I never suggest otherwise, might be good to play here at some point, right? Yeah. Um, I, uh, if they win nine games, maybe he's into it. I just don't see them winning six to eight huh. games and him being – I think he's maybe in, in New York for the ceremony, but winning the award I think will be tough. But, but I think we all agree um, that he's the best player in college football, but he might not right. win the award. All right, Jeff, we got to do this with you. We okay. call this Cuz's Conundrum. Cuz's Conundrum. This is one question. I, there's no way you've been asked this before. All right, there's a good part, and then there's a consequence at the end, okay? Sure. Here's the thing. You go out there, you're on a one-man crusade to bring back the Pac-12, and you do it. You actually do it. You go around the country, you give speeches, you talk to the right people, and you bring it back, and you get credit for this. You're held as the you're fixing sports, college sports at large. You get it done. The only problem is you now have to have your children homeschooled by Deion Sanders. Do you do it? <laughs> um, the, geez, the homeschool idea to me, I don't want to, you know, I just, no, no, I, I. <laughs> No, um, is it the homeschool idea? Is it Dion homeschooling the kids? You're, you're, you're it, it, both, both. The homeschool idea, I just, I get, I, I get it. Like right. I understand, but uh, I like that my kids go to school every day and that they're with other kids and in classrooms and with friends and. Okay, uh, what if they go to school but Dion's their teacher in every class? Oh, do, do I bring the? Okay, how about this? The, the better question yeah. should be. If we bring the Pac-12 back and Oregon wins a national championship in in football, then I think I would I'd be okay with Dion being my kid's teacher. You would, okay. Yeah, yeah. If I'm Oregon, gonna change that around. If Oregon wins a championship, for sure, yeah. Good, good. I think we made some. Uh, you know, I could I could do that. I know, like the superintendent of the school district your kids go to, and I'm gonna make some calls. You should. And you get this Pac-12 thing going. I, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm in. Let's go. I I mean I do anything for Oregon championship at some point in my life. I've been very blessed as a fan of of teams i was a niners fan as a kid a lakers fan a giants baseball fan and became a chiefs fan when my brother was there like i've been very fortunate with championships in my lifetime um mm -hmm. i need a, an oregon championship now to finish it all right let's get it done buddy you can follow jeff schwartz on twitter at jeff schwartz he is the best jeff thanks so much for being here go ducks this weekend yes let's go thank you buddy appreciate it yeah, we'll be right back to break down the week six NFL slate with Brother Bry next on Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. All right, welcome back to Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. What a great time to be a sports fan for my next guest. The NHL is back. We've got the WNBA Finals in full swing. And most importantly, Aiden O'Connell is now starting again <laughs> for his Las Vegas Raiders. Brother Bry is here. What's happening, Bry? What's going on, buddy? <laughs> I mean, which of those three things are you most excited? It really it must be. I it's like uh, WM choosing between your children. WNBA finals. Is it? Yeah. 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 Kidding. Seriously, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Yeah. 
why is game two against all these other games it's, and plus baseball? I, it drives me crazy. I, I couldn't, I can't understand it. Also, it drives me crazy, Brian. I was five and nine last week, and you were five, nine, and one to start. To right? start, yeah. Yeah. Not but good. Last week, yeah. I was, I think I was 0 for my first eight last week, and there were only like eight games. I was like, oh man, I really <laughs> might not win any of these early games. They kill me. Maybe I should sleep until noon. I think that's the way to do it. But we have another early one, another early London game this week. What is it like to watch this on the East Coast and not? pass out face first into your morning espresso during the yeah look i'm okay yeah 9 30 is not that's not bad for me right it's just i you know obviously late in the day is much worse for me i don't know how you do it sal i i would much rather be where i am i like to go to bed a little wow. bit later yeah. i don't the 6 30 football is not that's not 6 30 is not ideal but not i do ideal. like having something on right when i wake up <laughs> it's forced me to bet on epl which is yeah, uh, you know, not enjoyable but anyway all right let's do this game the jaguars in their home away from home take on the bears in london chicago is actually technically the home team and they are favored by one and a half 44 and a half is the over under against jacksonville Bears three and two, Jags one and four. Who would have thought they let Doug Peterson on the plane and Robert Sala got fired? I didn't see the swerve. I didn't see that. I thought it'd be the other way around. And now it's back to back overseas for the Jaguars. I don't think the Bears are as good as three and two. I don't think the Jags are as bad as one and four, but they have trouble tying the bow at the end, this Jacksonville team. So I'm going to go player prop. Trevor Lawrence under 230 and a half passing yards he's done this he's gone under that number in four of his last five road games let's count this as a road game either way it is they got a runner in tank bigsby now 100 yards last week 90 the week before it's getting a lot of carries they're relying on the ground game bears also fifth best scoring defense and sixth best pass defense in the league and now that happened give me lawrence under 230 and a half you're going to take a team here yeah i'm going to take the jaguars plus one and a half look the jags finally broke their losing streak last week <clears throat> which you know, they had lost five in a row. They, they had lost nine of their last 10. But look, the last week, their offense was finally clicking, accounting for 500 yards of offense, right? So, and you have to like the fact, right, the Jaguars are playing in London. They are London's team, right? They won they won their, twice their last year, three of the last four. I think, you know, Bears call, coming off two home wins. You know, Caleb Williams has looked good. But I think this is a tough challenge for the rookie. So give. I know you said this is a road game. But I view yeah. this as more of a home game for the Jaguars than actually Jacksonville is. So I'll take the London Jaguars at plus one and a half. Okay. All right. Listen, not bad. Uh, and, you know, I immediately thought teaser. I see one and a half on the plus. I'm like, oh, that, that's a seven and a half. I just have to find a dance partner. No, I got to stay away from the teaser. I'm not doing that. <laughs> Baltimore, six and a half point favorite home against Washington. This is turf war here. This is, this is the wires, what's going on right now. And who would have thought this would be the game of the week featuring the two best offenses in the league in terms of scoring? I hate to pick against Washington. So I'm going to go Ravens first half minus four and a half. That seems silly too, considering what Washington does. They barely punt in the last three weeks. Um, but I think this is where Baltimore starts trucking teams at home. They actually started it in their last home game against Buffalo. Lamar and that offense got off to a 21-3 lead in that, I think, Sunday night game, right? I think we see a similar result this Sunday. Henry, 199 on the ground in his home uh, last home game. I think we see a rare Jaden Daniels interception early. Going to be a fun one, but for our purposes, I'm just interested in the first half. I think it's going to end with Baltimore on top 17-7. to seven. I'm going to lay the four and a half first half. What do you have? All right, well, I'm going to go with Washington. I'm going to go against you kind of here. Um, I'm taking the six and a half. Look, Washington's been, been the most impressive team in football so far, right? Their offense has been the best. It's, you know, the combination of Daniels and Kingsbury has been tough to stop so far. And look, we have to give Dan Quinn a lot of credit, right? It, this this commander's defense was terrible last year. And they've improved mm -hmm. drastically, right? It's not like there's a lot of different talent there, but they've just improved drastically since last year. So now you have the Ravens, right, coming off an emotional division win. I think this is going to, even though it's like a turf war, I do think it's going to be a little bit of a letdown here. And and we saw that Ravens secondary. They were torched last week against Cincinnati here. So I think uh, I think this is a really fun game, but I would take Washington plus six and a half here. So let's go to our next game, Tampa Bay. Actually, can we skip this game? Tampa Bay at New Orleans. <laughs> The Bucks are a three and a half point favorite. Forty one and a half is the over under. Your guy Derek Carr, your old guy, he's out. It's Spencer Rattler in for New Orleans. I mean, there's no way I'm picking this right. I really do want to skip it. There's <laughs> not a chance. 
But so I might as well just take the points, and that's what I'm doing. I feel Tampa Bay is the best in the division, but last week was nuts, and it shows you how wacky the division is. Saints are seven and one against the spread as a division dog. They're four and one against the spread in the last five home games. Is a four point swing accurate for Derek Carr to Spencer Rattler? Because that's what it no. was. It was like it was like four, four and a half. You don't think it is. So no, sight unseen so with Rattler. I you know, we saw him in South Carolina and Oklahoma. I'm gonna take him getting the points over a Bucks team, who really, to be honest, might have their focus somewhere else with the terrible storm going on and living where they live and family and everything else. So I'm going to take two, uh, who dat 24, 16. All right. Well, so, um, you know, I, I don't mind the saints for the game here, but I think I'm going to take Tampa minus one and a half first quarter plus plus one twenty eight. Uh, with the exception, uh, exception of that Broncos game, Tampa's come out really hot in the first quarter. Mm-hmm. I like them to do that again. And then, you know, again, coming off a bad loss to Atlanta, they have the extra rest this time to prepare. Whereas new Orleans, right. Is on short rest without their car. That team in general is just a little bit banged up. Now, I am intrigued by Spencer Rattler. Like, he, he's a guy I, I don't know. He could be very good. He could be terrible here. He but... wants to meet you. I know you said you don't know him, but, yeah, I could maybe arrange it. But uh, but I think it's going to take some time for him to get into this game here. I think they're going to be conservative to start. So I like Tampa to get off to a good start. So I'm going to say minus one and a half first quarter at plus 128. Okay, babyface Joel Solomon, get on the phone with Spencer Rattler's agent. I want to <laughs> set up a meeting with him and brother Brian. Maybe uh, Fud Ruckers in Louisiana somewhere. I don't know. We'll figure it out. All right, Philadelphia at nine and a half. This went up. It was eight and a half. They're home against the Browns. Um, Philly coming off a bye. Cleveland, I feel like, has been on a bye for two years ever since they, they signed Deshaun Watson. I, I just can't take them anymore, Brian. I can't do it. It's been fun. We have a friend who hates the Browns and – hates this Deshaun Watson deal, but I feel like it's owner malpractice and coach malpractice. If really Stefanski can't take Deshaun out at this point, because we saw what they did last year with someone who wasn't Deshaun Watson at quarterback, Joe Flacco took him to the playoffs. They had four quarterbacks. Their running back was out QBRs in the single digits week after week after week. It's got an awful offense. It doesn't have to be. But I'm going to go for the short thing. I'm taking Brown's team total under 16 and a half. I think it's minus 102. Here are their numbers. 13 points scored, 16, 18, 15, 17. This against now arrested Eagles defense. They're even throwing in the white cornerback, Bri. It's, uh, <laughs> DeGene is playing. They're like, yeah, all right, we got to make this a little challenging here. The kid they drafted. Yep. That's how not freaked out they are about this Brown's offense. 29-13 Eagles. Gives Philadelphia something to cheer about. So those, those, uh, they're just those poor fans. I feel so, so bad about the Philly fans, but <laughs> they're going to win 29 13. Play the team total under 16 and a half. Oh, well, your score, right? 29 13 plays out well for me because I'm taking uh, the minus nine and a half here, Sal. You know, the, the big favorites do scare me because we've seen the success of the underdogs, mm-hmm. but the way this Watson situation is going, it could get really ugly for ownership, right? I feel like it's just on the brink, right? And, and I, I, we don't know what the Browns are waiting for. Watson can't move anymore. He can't throw anymore. He makes terrible decisions. So Stefanski at this point is either being, you know, told by ownership he has to play him or it's just a big slap back at ownership to just say, I'm just going to keep playing uh, this guy regardless. Uh, but, you know, the Eagles themselves, right, they're coming off a terrible loss. They had the that had the buy here. So I think mm-hmm. they get right in this game. And I think this is uh, somewhat of a blowout. So, so I'm going to say similar thing. They won by 15 plus. Yeah. I don't know how you could really like the Browns in this spot. Although mm-hmm. people said that to me the last three or four weeks that I've taken them in a row. So uh, <laughs> I guess I can see it. All right. Now this is a game. We're kind of going to be throwing darts here. The Colts, this line went up. It was one and a half. Now the Colts are a two and a half point favorite. They're at Tennessee. 42 and a half is the over under and any combination of quarterbacks could start in this game right we saw anthony richardson was going to give it try to give it a go on sunday where it was with flacco the last couple of weeks we see will levis is gonna what did he say he says i'm fighting like hell to get out there on sunday well fight till the end will because i'm gonna take the colts here I need you to be in there so I could bet against them. Not not that Mason Rudolph scares me too much, but it's another South game I'll probably get wrong. But I'm going to give the two and a half. Colts seem to do better with their backups without Richardson and Taylor. They still managed 34 against the Jaguars. They almost pulled that out. They beat the Steelers the week before that. You know, their offense was kind of clicking. They're 4-1 and one against the spread this year. 
So Flacco over Rudolph, Flacco over Levis, you know, Richardson over Levis. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's going to be a fun uh, combination. 27-23, I'm going to take the Colts. Well, it's pretty uh, high scoring there for this crappy yeah. game, right? Yeah. <laughs> but so I'm going to go uh, something I found on FanDuel, the closest game. And this is Sunday mm. only. So closest game, Sunday only, plus 850. And I, so I really like this is a fun bet. I feel like this is not a fun game because, again, like like you were saying, with the NFC South and the AFC South, these, these games are like exactly the same, I feel like, every time we watch them. The one thing we know is this is going to be really tight. And so mm. far, there's been three games within the AFC South division, and the point differential in total is nine points. And the last time these two teams met, it went to overtime. So expect another close one uh, that comes down to the last second. Uh, I thought it would be a little bit more of a defensive game, but – Whatever, I just want it to be close, uh, plus 850, so. All right, Houston, minus six and a half at New England. This went down from seven. 37 and a half is the over-under. Drake May gets his first start against the third best pass defense in the league. Not sure how wise this is, putting him in now. I thought it would be against Miami, but the ineptitude of the Jets is a good distraction for a curious Patriot decision, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, I could hit the under point totals, but since it's the highest spread on the board, I should probably just take the Pats money line. Actually, the the other one that you picked was the highest spread on the board. But this is a this could be a trap too, where another big favorite loses. I'm gonna go under 37 and a half. That's a long way of saying I'm going under. But I think this in general is a drab offensive game. Pats defense stepped up against the Dolphins, the Bengals, and their lone win. Uh, and Seattle, they even played well. The under is 4-1 and one in the Texans' last five games. Stroud's going to have his moments. Now they're a little shorthanded without Nico Collins. I think it's a 17-13 type game. Not a fantasy bonanza by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Give me the under. What do you like? Well, it's amazing how low this total is, right, considering yeah. when you get Stroud on the field. But that's kind of what New England's produced so far. But I do mm-hmm. think six and a half is too many points in this game with New England playing at home. We finally get to see Drake May, right? They've gotten nothing from Brissett to start the year. And they actually potentially could have won a couple of these games if uh, maybe May was playing in them. But even though the Texans are four and one, uh, both teams are one, three and one against the spread. And I think Nico Collins, is a, that's a big blow for this team offensively. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I just think this Texas team hasn't fully clicked yet. So I think the six and a half points is way too much, especially, you know, going on the road. This team is used to playing really well indoors. Going on the road here, I'll, I'll take the six and a half side. Uh, last of the early afternoon games, Green Bay, four and a half point favorite, 47 and a half the over under against Arizona. That was 49 and a half, went down a couple points. Green Bay went down. Uh, this Arizona team, not bad. Their game. They stuck around against San Francisco. They pulled it out. Green Bay almost blew it against the Rams, but they got it out a tough win. They seem to be back on track, at least offensively, with Jordan Love. And I'm going to hit a Jordan Love prop here. Uh, over 255 and a half passing yards. He drops back a lot um, in these home games. Four of his last five home games, he's thrown 34-plus attempts He's gone over 256 in five straight home games. That's 316 a game during that stretch. Tucker Craft out of nowhere. Jaden Reed's been good. I'm still not sure what's up with Romeo Dobbs, but we'll find out. Anyway, there's enough evidence to think that Packers will throw for a hefty total against this Cards 25th ranked defense. Jordan Love over 255 and a half. What do you like? Yeah, I'm going to take the over 47 and a half in this game. Both, both teams are three and two on the over so far to start the season. You know, the Cardinals defense has been weird, right? The fact that what we saw against the 49ers in the second half. Uh, you know, they they played really well. But in general, we, they came into the season. We thought they, we, they'd be bad. At times, they've been bad. We saw Washington and Buffalo move the ball all over them. So I expect a lot of big plays in this, this game by both teams. Uh, and the Packers, their defense, too, has not been great. They've struggled against the two good offenses they've played against this year so far. They struggled against. So I think this game gets into the 50s. So I'm going to go over 47 and a half. All right, Bri, well done. We're going to take a brief, uh, brief break. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. Brother Bri, brief <laughs> break with Brother Bri. We're, he's going to stick around. We're going to get the rest of the Week 6 games. Big D versus medium-sized D, Dallas and Detroit, and then Bri's Raiders take on the Steelers. Those games usually ain't great for him. All next on Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend. Welcome 
Welcome back to Cousin Sal's Winning Weekend here with Brother Bry. Bry, your Twitter handle is the Brother Bry. Is that inspired by the Ohio State? Where did you get that from? Uh, I think you gave that to me. I oh, I gave it yeah, to you. You gave yeah. it to me. Okay, so I now I have to ask myself if I was inspired to give you through the house. I'll, I'll I'll talk to myself afterwards. All right, let's get back to the rest of the week six NFL slate, starting with the late afternoon games. The Chargers were off last week, but I'm sure Jim Harbaugh was videotaping some games somewhere illegally. They're two and two. The Broncos are three and two. What? Coming up on three straight wins this game, the Chargers are a three point favorite. Thirty five and a half is the over under. It's in Denver. Um, Bucks, Jets, Raiders. Now the ch- rested Chargers come to town. I'm going to take the Bolts minus three. They had a couple weeks to heal, right? Herbert had the ankle injury. Joe Alt should be available. Khalil Mack should all be there returning. I know Denver has a top three or four defense, and they're just getting it done. But these are the types of games they brought Jim Harbaugh in for, right? So low-scoring game. J.K. Dobbins breaks one late. Nick struggles, I think, in this one. I'm going to say 23 16, the Chargers win. Doesn't matter if they're on the road, probably better for them. They win by seven. What do you like? Well, I don't like that score at all, 23 oh. 16, because I'm going to go under 35 and a half. I, I actually, can't change it. I'm I, sorry. There's you can't now. I, I do love nothing. the under in this one. It's like an Iowa over under, right? And yeah. if, if you were going to have the lowest, you know, FanDuel also offers the lowest scoring game here, Sal. So this would be one of the two games, I think. This one and the Raiders uh, mm-hmm. Steelers game would be the two games that I think are the lowest scoring. The Chargers games are 4-0 on the unders here so far. They're averaging less than 30 points combined in these games here. So uh, the Chargers are just playing a super conservative game, right? They don't want to turn the ball over. They want to run the ball. They want the clock to keep moving here. Uh, So when you combine that with the Broncos, who scored 16 total points against the Jets and the Steelers, basically the two good defenses they played so far, I think it's a very low-scoring game. And the last, if you look at the last three games between these two teams, I know it didn't have Harbaugh and it had Peyton, uh, but they were very low scoring. So I'm going to go the under here, 35 and a half. So I'm not going to scramble to find it right now, but this might be another good one to bet under three and a half total touchdowns. You know, sure. you, won't, you won't get killed. A lot on of field goals, yeah. This one too. Um, well, this is where I have it. In fact, Pittsburgh minus three, 36 and a half at Las Vegas, your Raiders, your team against babyface Joel Solomon's team. Aiden O'Connell, very exciting. We talked about it, and I'm, right here, I'm going to go under the three and a half total touchdowns. And no, another lowish scoring contest. Steelers games are four and one to the under this year, but instead of taking the under, there's just too many long field goals these days, Bri, right? So I think you could protect yourself and bet under touchdowns under three and a half. The Raiders try to run the ball, but they're 28th in yards per carry. You know that. Pittsburgh allows less than or fewer than 15 points a game. Atlanta won, Denver none, Chargers one touchdown against Pittsburgh. It's all offensive futility, however you look at it. And we saw how the Steelers moved the ball against very bad defenses, baby facials, all my Cowboys. Um, 1913 final, two touchdowns, six field goals. Give me under. Two and a half. 1913 Raiders, are you saying? Uh, but you, yeah, sure, because yeah. I'm, t- I'm yeah. taking the Raiders yeah. plus three here. <laughs> Um, and, and like I said, too, this is the other game that you should look at lowest possible score. And like you said, Sal, you had 32 in this game. Uh, mm-hmm. So I do think it's a very low scoring one. But the Ra- look, I hope the Raiders lose. I- I'm, I'm in full tank mode already. I know it's two and three, but I'm full tank mode because I just hate this team right now. Uh, but the Raiders are desperate, right? Mm-hmm. Raiders are desperate. Yeah. A loss here, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, Pierce could start losing the locker room a little bit. But I do think going to O'Connell who was a solid starter for them last year, is the right move. Uh, we've seen Minshew just have way too many bad mistakes. We said That Denver game, he basically threw it away for them early here. So the one thing I will say, and I always say this for the last 10 years, for as bad as the Raiders have been for the last 20 years, <laughs> they have a lot of success against the Steelers, especially I Tomlin. I don't know right. what it is. Even even when they go into Pittsburgh, they, they're actually probably better in Pittsburgh than they'd they would be at home. They'd be Roethlisberger, I remember. They'd be yeah. Roethlisberger. Yeah, they'd be the worst, yeah. I think, with Jamarcus Russell, right? It's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. It's insane. So um, I'm taking the points here. I do think it's a very low-scoring defensive game here, Sal. So uh, I, I'd take the points at home. All right. Uh, next, Atlanta at Carolina. This is really a late afternoon game. Atlanta, six and a half point favorite, 46 Great. and a half. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, if you look at the over under compared to these other 36s, you know, we 35s, we, we could at least expect points, but I'm just surprised this isn't 
before the London game. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I, I, I wish I could pass. I can't get these NFC South games right, so I'm just going to take the points here. Um, you know, if, if one team was playing against himself, I wouldn't get it right. But Atlanta 2-5 and five against the spread in the last seven. I felt like a jerk praising Andy Dalton all last week, and I, but I refuse to believe Kirk Cousins is a 500-plus yard passer week after week and that Kyle Pitts can catch passes regularly. So two bad defenses on the Falcons' side. Troy Anderson's questionable and starting corner D. Alford's in concussion protocol, so that could be good for Andy Dalton. Atlanta allows almost 150 rushing yards a game, so it could be a good game for Chuba Hubbard. And good for anyone back in Carolina, I would say, plus six and a half. 22-19 final. What do you got? All right. I'm going to go with Drake London, Sal, anytime uh, touchdown at plus 120. Mm -hmm. It took a few games, but London and Cousins have a lot of chemistry going right now. Uh, And London's finally starting to turn into maybe that number one wide receiver they were expecting. He scored in three of his last four games. He has 18 catches and 25 targets over his last two weeks. I think that continues against his terrible Panthers team, so... Uh, London anytime touchdown at plus 120 is my all point. right it is the London game after all all right <laughs> Detroit three-point favorite 52 and a half at Dallas I'm not going to be a homer here Brian nice. I'm not doing it we got the win Cowboys got the win they needed last week against the Steelers and now Detroit I'm going to take Detroit I'm gonna give myself a little room here Detroit over 27 and a half points I can still root for my team you have a Lions team I think we could finally say is clicking offensively. What, they put up 42 against the Seahawks last week? Um, that Seahawks defense is stronger than Dallas. I don't know. We played out of our minds last Sunday night. Fields, Pickens, Najee, not Goff, St. Brown, and Montgomery by any stretch. Gibbs, Jameson Williams, the, the talent goes on and on. They're going to burn us. They're going to beat us. Cowboys no longer a force at home. You know, don't forget, Lions with a little chip on their shoulder. Last year, they came to town. There was that, that weird call with the too many offensive linemen or whatever it was. Somebody couldn't report. So uh, they're pissed off. I'm going to have the same game parlay for you later in the show. But for now, it's going to be Lions over 27 and a half points. Probably, I would say, 33-23 final. All right. Yeah, I like that song because I'm, I'm taking the Lions here at minus three. And I'm, although I think last week I did a huge money line bet on the Packers. Um, this is similar this week. I'm going to go huge money line bet on the Lions here. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> although the Cowboys have screwed me all season here. Um, but Sunday night, like you said, was a big win for the Cowboys. But I just think defensively that was a good matchup for them, right? Going against that Steelers offense. Lions, it will be a completely different story, right? They're going to be making big plays on this Cowboys defense. Now you're going to realize missing some of these Cowboy players like Parsons and Lawrence. Uh, is going to be a bit of an issue here. And uh, unless the Cowboys can run the ball really well, control possessions, I don't see them covering at all here. Three straight bad performances at home. So um, I think the Lions cover here so pretty easily uh, coming off their bye week. All right. Now we go to the night games and uh, both at MetLife. Now, last time we had back-to-back MetLife night games, I don't think the MetLife fans saw a touchdown, right? It was like a bunch of field goals. Cowboys had beaten up the Giants, the Jets had lost. So I think we're, I don't know if this is any premonition or we're going to go opposite here. It starts off, this game was lousy probably two weeks ago, and now all of a sudden I'm interested. Maybe it's still lousy, but the Bengals are three and a half point favorite Sunday night, 47 and a half at the Giants in MetLife. Wow, I'm taking some bad teams. Giants plus three and a half, I'm doing it. (laughs) Bengals I know are one and four, Giants are two and three. Now, the Giants had seven sacks against Geno Smith last week. thats uh, I think that's an underreported stat to come out of uh, the Week 5 games. They play hard when they want to play hard. And the Bengals have a bottom seven or eight offensive line. They've allowed 103 points over the last three games, and Carolina's in that mix, by the way. Giants 9-3 and three against the number last 12. I guess I'm taking Daniel Jones over Joe Burrow here. I know it doesn't sound right. I'm, I'm going for it. 28-23 G-Men, and Collinsworth gets to see his old team lose. All right, 28-23. That's good for me. I'm going over 48 uh, and a half. I do like the Giants, too, in this one, Sal, although you would feel like a little bit better if this was a 1 o'clock game, right? If, the, yeah, if yeah. this was a 1 o'clock game, you'd feel even better about the 3 and a half. You never know Burrow in prime time. 1 p.m.? We, we still haven't established what's <laughs> Yeah, late. 1 what? okay. Eastern time. <laughs> right. right. Um, but, I, yeah, I do like the over here because the Bengals offensively look great the last two weeks, they, you know, especially since they're fully healthy and they have Higgins in that lineup. But they just cannot seem to stop anyone. 
Uh, and what I will say, the way Jones looked last week, you're going to have a healthier neighbors and you're gonna, neighbors coming back in this game. They got the running game going so far. So I think this is a pretty high scoring game, like you said. And I think this gets into the 50s. So over 48 and a half. All right. There you go. All right. Bills and Jets. Bills are a two and a half point favorite, 40 and a half. Let's see if the coaching change makes a difference. I'll tell you what, I almost did it. I almost went the whole slate, Bri, without making a teaser, but I couldn't. I can't do that to myself and my many, many fans <laughs> who depend on it. I'm taking a six point teaser. Jets plus eight and a half, the over 34 and a half. Um, you know, Bills 26 defensively against the run. You might actually see Brees Hall bust out, do something positive. I just think they're going to move the ball this week. The, the crowd's going to be into it. It's kind of a last hurrah thing for the Jets, who could be in first place with a win uh, with the over 34 and a half adjusted. Check out these last 10 night games, Bri. They've all gone over 34 points. So I'm, I'm banking on that with the adjusted line to happen again. Something with the dark air or something. Salah's <laughs> out and the Jets in first place after a slight upset. 21-16, I'm picking. This is the final going Jets and the over. Nice. Uh, yeah, I like it, Sal. Um, yeah, I'm taking the Jets here, plus two and a half. I, I've, I've said forever how much uh, I didn't think Sal was a head coach. I think this game becomes a must-win for the Jets here, and, and I, I do think they get it. I think they'll be fired up in this one. Yeah, a loss here, I'm not saying it's over the season, but a loss here is, it would be very bad, I feel like, for the, for the Jets, especially considering... Buffalo has looked terrible the last two weeks, really, for the most part. Offensively, they've struggled. It, you kind of see, right, without a wide receiver yeah. uh, starting to hurt them a little bit. So the Jets' defense is going to play well. I do think Rodgers is going to make uh, enough plays in, in this game for the Jets to win, so i like them to cover the two and a half. All right, there you go. Great work, Brian. Get some get some water for that. Yeah, we, I felt like I just talked to <laughs> RFK Jr. for 29 minutes. So. So <laughs> uh, we're going to be right back to wrap things up. That's Brother Brian with us. Cousin Sal's winning weekend coming up. All right, welcome back. We're almost out of time. I do have a same game parlay for you. I won last week, paid almost five to one. This one, not a homer bet, not even in the least. I'm king on Detroit over my beloved cowpokes. Let's go Lions over 27 and a half points. I gave that out with Brother Bry earlier. Alternate total over 46 and a half points. Jared Goff is going to throw for two or more touchdown passes, and at least one of those touchdown passes will go to Sam Laporta. Remember him? That one pays over four to one. I think all this can happen, and the Cowboys could still win, right? Yeah, right. My thanks to Jeff Schwartz. You can watch my full interview with Jeff on the Ringer's YouTube page. Thanks to Brother Bry for all those week six picks, which I'm sure he's already second guessing. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for watching and listening. And please always remember, you may feel like an underdog, but just know you're all my favorites. Happy handicapping. Happy handicapping.